Hello, my name is Abby Heber, and for this final discussion, I decided to focus in on a 20th century salesman known as Clark Stanley. He dubbed himself the Rattlesnake King, and he would go on to travel throughout the Midwest selling a fraudulent elixir and swindling unsuspector, unsuspecting farmers of their money. Stanley's business name was the Snake Oil Salesman, which some of you may have heard that term before because it has resided itself in history and infamy as a term synonymous with trickery, deception, and financial profit through emotional manipulation. So to back up a little bit and tell his story, Clark Stanley was born in 1856 in Texas and worked as a cowboy, but he would trade in his saddle for clean shirts and savvy sales talk as he entered the business world by selling snake oil. In his 1897 work titled The Life and Adventures of the American Cowboy, Stanley claimed that he learned the art of crafting snake oil from a Native American medicine man. After learning of snake oil, Stanley saw the financial gain that could be garnered from it and took to capturing and breeding rattlesnakes and making his own version of the oil. Though there does exist evidence that snakes do provide medicinal properties, this is only a certain species of snake. The Chinese water snake contains omega-3 fatty acids, which has been used by the Chinese for centuries to aid with inflammation, anky joints, and arthritis. Even if the oil from water snakes was entirely helpful to sufferers of physical ailments, Stanley did not have access to the Chinese water snake. He did, however, have access to the Midwestern native rattlesnake. With this snake as his mascot, Stanley would make his concoction and lure unsuspecting, naive patrons to purchase his dishonest elixir. His promise was a soothing ease to the hardworking man's shoulder pain from chopping wood or back pain and dirt in the mines or brutal aches throbbing through a mother's fingers as she cooks in the kitchen all day. It was not merely the packaging of his syrup that enticed onlookers, it was the spectacle. As the public debut of his snake oil in the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, Stanley stood by his booth, which was adorned with signage reading of a cure for a multitude of illnesses. He wore clean, pressed clothing, a stark contrast from his muddy cowboy boots. At these booths, Stanley made a show of gripping a live rattlesnake with his bare hands, chopping its head off, slicing the creature in half lengthwise, and boiling the innards in a pot of herbs, oils, and other unknown substances. He did this while speaking to the people of how much better their lives would be without the bodily pain that haunted them. The aches that made daily work that much more difficult were those Stanley preached that he had an antidote for. Scholar of medical ephemera that swept the nation during the 1900s, William H. Helfand wrote on the showy nature of Stanley's selling booths in an article for the Virginia Quarterly Review. It reads, Clark Stanley used to appear at county fairs and medicine shows and have a stand. He would get a crowd around him, bring out his snake, and chop the snake's head off, and cut out the tallow from underneath the skin of the snake, and describe how he made the snake oil. And then he'd sell the package. You can see from the advertisement that it was good for many things, which is one of the key methods of recognizing a quack. When you've got too many things that will cure, there's something wrong. Nothing cures that many things. Still applicable today is good advice. There is no surprise that the hardworking men and women needed their physical bodies to perform effectively throughout the day. Physical labor is how many folks made a living, therefore low-income farmers would pay the smooth-talking snake oil salesman on the feeble hope that tomorrow their pain would lessen so their bodies could perform more effectively. Word of mouth grew Stanley's business to become the largest seller of patent medicine in the United States from 1897 to 1916. He went on to establish the production facilities in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. All was seemingly well for Stanley until one day the law caught up with the cowboy and he became an outlaw. The 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act was enacted as a preventative measure to ensure all U.S. and international food products would not have misleading labels and that all ingredients in the food item would be listed on the packaging. In 1916, after nearly two decades of conning rural individuals, the fraudulent marketing of Stanley was finally put to an end. The United States attorney collected and examined Stanley's concoction and listed the ingredients that they found. Analysis of a sample of the article by the Bureau of Chemistry of this department showed it to consist principally of a light mineral oil, petroleum product, mixed with about 1% of fatty oil, probably beef fat. The release of these ingredients in the reports revealed a truth that shocked many and destroyed the career of the silver-tongued entrepreneur. The sales for Stanley Snake Oil would come to a halt immediately. Even though he took paychecks of countless numbers of innocent customers, he would only be fined a mere $20 for the extent of his misleading advertising. 
Clark Stanley's method of twisted false advertising would cement a euphemism that would carry on for generations. Even now in the 21st century, if someone is labeled as a snake oil salesman, folks know to stand clear of their poisonous tongue. I would like to conclude with a quote from the work, The Human Vision of Wendell Berry, to show how the pride of mankind can lead many very talented entrepreneurs to fall. The virtuous person does not willingly distort reality, for he possesses the humility to admit of essential human limits. But what would induce such an ill-fated war on reality? The answer is as old as the human story. Pride, the old lie, ye shall be as gods, persists and amplified by the power of medicine. The consequences of believing that lie are perhaps more acute than ever before. The longing for control is, of course, only a dream, yet we have pursued it with abandon. The desire to dominate reality necessarily leads to a willful simplification whereby the complexities of creation are shorn away and a new, though false, world is embraced as authentic. Thank you for listening. I look forward to hearing and viewing all of your discussion posts. And I've enjoyed this class. So thank you. Bye-bye.